Good morning. What do these four people have in common? Noah, Galileo, Tesla, and Kwame Nkrumah. Yes, they're all dead, and yes, they all changed the world with their visions, but that's not it, no. Here's what all four of them had in common. At one point or the other, all the people that I mentioned were thought to be crazy. Yep, bonkers, totally nuts, off their rockers, one ball short of a kinky party, stark raving mad. When Noah was telling people there was going to be a great big flood which would wash away all living things from the earth, of course everyone thought he had totally lost the plot. What he was saying simply did not fit in with their understanding of how things work in this world. And so his words made no sense to them. Until they were drowning. Then they understood. But of course, it was too late by then and the ark doors would not open for them. Galileo. He was actually hailed as a genius by many, including the almighty Catholic Church, which was also the political seat of power in Italy back then. Until he made an absolutely ridiculous claim. Galileo suggested that when the sun rose in the east and set in the west, it wasn't revolving around the earth, but rather the earth was revolving around the sun, and so were all the other planets. The Catholic Church promptly changed his status from smart man to madman and locked him up in his own house for the rest of his life. Of course, now that theory has been proved by every astronomer in the world. The church can't deny that the guy may not have been so cray cray after all. Nikola Tesla was probably one of the smartest scientists in human history. This is the guy who created wireless technology, radar, robotics, among thousands of other great creations. Now, Tesla's behavior was what people didn't seem to understand. So he had no home address. He chose to live only in hotels. He had an obsession with the number three. He imported special seeds to feed the pigeons in the park and spent ages calculating the volume of his food before eating it. Yet this same guy, who everyone thought was crazy, found a way to transmit electricity without wires. Let me say that again. He found a way to transmit electricity without wires. All right. And provided power for the entire city of Colorado Springs, free of charge, at a time when people were still marveling over the novelty of Thomas Edison's newly invented light bulb. Kwame Nkrumah. Now, he built the Akosumbo Dam at a time when Ghana hardly needed 10% of the total power it could produce. People in his own government considered it a colossal waste of time and resources for a country which couldn't even afford to pay its cocoa farmers. Now, when they learned that Akosumbo was actually just one of five dams that Nkrumah had planned to build in a circle with the outflow of each dam forming the inflow to the next, creating a self-perpetrating loop of never-ending power. One of his colleagues actually described it as the murmurings of a megalomaniac. Today, that megalomaniac's mad murmurings make absolute sense to a nation that would give anything for a reliable source of power. My dear friend, sometimes sanity is all about timing. The truth is that people assess you based on their understanding of the world and not yours. This can be particularly problematic when you have a vision or a perspective that they can't see or understand. When you have a vision or talent that is not shared by the people around you, it forces them to make a choice. Either accept that they don't know what you know or convince themselves that you are crazy. <laughs> I'm sure you can imagine the easier option for those people. Now, those who care about you will believe in your vision even if they can't see it. And they will support you with it no matter how outlandish or crazy it may seem. Those who don't care about you will not understand why you think you can do things that they can't. And to prove you wrong, they must bring you down. My dear friend, never lose faith in what you know. <clears throat> don't force yourself to conform to the rules of those who don't see what you see. 
After all, what's the use of having vision only to be guided by the blind? Let them call you names. Let them think you're crazy. Let them say what they like. In the end, when the rains come, when the lights go out, they will all realize that you were right all along and their earth does indeed revolve around your sun. My name is Kojo Yangsen and you may not know what I'm doing, but I do. Good morning, Ghana. Hello, good morning and welcome to the AMUs with me, Mapisa CBD. In our first story, police in the central region have arrested 340 suspected criminals at Kaswa in an operation dubbed Operation Storm Kaswa. The arrest, according to the police, forms part of measures employed by the security agencies to come back to the crime situation there. Briefing the media, Central Region Police Commander DCOP Habiba Tumasi Sapong warned they will make life uncomfortable for criminals at Kaswa and throughout the region. Richard Kojanyako has more. 340 suspected criminals include five females. The Operation Storm Kaswa by the police is an operation activated by the Central Regional Police Command to fight crime in the area. On the 20th of April, the Regional Police Command issued a release indicating the deployment of police personnel to augment what the command has at Kaswa. In today's operation, the police retrieved a total of 240 laptops, 142 assorted mobile phones and 6 Nigerian passports during the operation. They also found on 9 persons substances suspected to be Indian hemp. This UOP Habibet Chumesi Sapon is the Regional Police Commander. On 29th of April 2021, today, the Central Regional Police Command embarked on special operation dubbed Operation Storm Kaswa to climb down on rampart criminal activities in Kaswa municipality and its environment. The team went to Budumburam, Kaswa CP, Adade. Akwele and Nofako and arrested 340 suspects, most of them Nigerians, including five females. Nine of the suspects were found in possession of suspense, suspected to be Indian head. The regional police command is assuring criminals in Kaswa and its environs their reign is over. Again, the tenth city we spoke about on the 20th of April to be mounted within communities in Kaswa is in progress. Plans are advanced in collaboration with opinion leaders, informing community watch committees, inaugurations will be held soon. Media and community engagements are still ongoing. More informal cultivated. The command is once again reminding the general public that their cooperation is much needed. They should share information with the police. We say, if you see something, say something. And if you want to say something, say something about crime. 21-year-old Mason Richard Atta was lucky when a judge fined him 360 Ghana cities for stealing. His inability to pay the amount meant that he had to serve a one-year jail term. After serving eight months, an agenda by the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative to help free petty offenders has helped secure his freedom. The human rights body believes minor offenders such as Richard should be made to serve non-custodial sentences and not thrown into jail. Maxwell Agwaba has mourned the campaign by the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative to keep minor offenders out of prison. Of course, starting without Richard and his friend Sammy gained their freedom. <laughs> It was a normal day for Richard until his friend asked him for a fun trip. He says after he complained about his financial difficulties, 
His friend later managed to convince him to snatch a woman's hand back on the street. An alarm was raised and he was nearly lynched. My mother and family members did not visit me at the police station. I am happy I'm free now. I did not get anyone to pay the 360 Ghana cities fine for me. Prison is not the best place to live. We did not get good food here. The soup was like a mirror. I saw my face in it any time I'm served. Humans are not supposed to eat that. I would advise young people to be careful out there. What happened before you come there? Richard's mate at the James Camp prison, Sami, says he abandoned his work when he started facing financial difficulties and started breaking into the homes of his neighbors. He was arrested on the day he stole 1,300 Ghana CDs and a flat screen television. I'm a step and, uh, I forget the work we are doing. I go ghetto. I follow friends, go stay ghetto mm. and live ghetto life. Follow friends, do bad things. You are breaking people's. You, if not catch, uh, you go straight. If you meet you, I will collect your things and them things. Then I know how to collect something from someone. That thing is not yours. Do my own. If you sleep, I can come to your, your room inside. I can break, take your things. If you're not there, I can break your door. Come still. That time you will come, you know. The push for non-custodial sentences recently increased after um, the incarceration of actress Rosemond um, Adade Brown. Well, the deputy director of prisons here at the James Cam prison, Rafael Twekpe, believes that non-custodial sentences will help decongest Ghana's prisons. Was somebody going to steal one file, and then he's been thrown into prison for three years? Calculate the amounts that the government is going to spend on that person. If you ask me, it would have been ideal if that person is sent to a poultry farm somewhere to support the poultry farm for even six months. Away from that, more than 4,200 people in 20 communities are to be displaced by the construction of the Palagu multipurpose dam project. The project will also affect over 3,200 farmers with an estimated 6,761 hectares of farmlands. Project director Dr. Kweku Yafu, however, says the affected persons will be compensated as part of a resettlement plan. There's more in the following reports. The report said the project will be located between the Upper East Region districts of Boku West, Garu, Timpani, Binduri and Talensi, and the Bunkurugu, Jiju, West Mamprosi and East Mamprosi municipalities in the North East Region. Among the compensation packages for those to be affected, permanent residential dwellings will be replaced at the resettlement site, sanitation facilities will be provided by the project, temporary structures such as farm huts will be compensated in cash. Compensations would also be paid for all lands and crops to the affected owners. Herdsmen will be compensated for the loss of grazing land as well as those into shared nut collection and processing, small-scale mining and other micro-enterprises. Under housing, infrastructure and social services, the report said the following will be provided in both affected and resettlement communities. The construction of four chips compounds with staff accommodation, two health facilities at Wulugu and Samini, four kindergarten, four primary and three junior high schools, in addition to rehabilitation of six educational facilities in the affected district. Borehole, toilet facilities, construction of feeder rules, ten community centers and five chief palaces provision of markets, construction of six mosques and five churches, and many others will be provided. There is also a livelihood restoration and assistance program for all those to be affected. The report also outlined the impact of the project on both the physical and biological environment and an implementation plan.
The project director, Dr. Kweku Wiafe, spoke to Joy News after the meeting. As you are aware, uh, a project of this nature has certain uh, impacts on the people who are living within what we call the affected area. In this case, the affected area is the area that will be flooded after the construction of the dam. Uh, and all both, uh, as well as the construction of the rear downstream for the irrigation. Now, this uh, we are required by law and by international practice to ensure that these people are not made worse off. Now, let's go to the northeast region where residents there are calling on government to ensure the complete ban of illegal lodging of economic trees in the area. According to them, years of indiscriminate felling of rosewood and other tree species have affected rainfall patterns and exposed the communities to the vagaries of the weather and natural disasters. The residents made the call after a heavy rainstorm, rendered many homeless in the community and want governments to flush out all illegal loggers and merchants in order to forestall future disasters. Correspondent Ilias Tanko visited the community and filed this report. The Yepabongo community, nestled in the corner of the Yizesiwa trunk road, was once rich in economic trees, including rose woods and papa. Like many communities in this overseas district, it is now a community severely hit by illegal logging activities. On the 20th of this month, Exactly a week ago, the small farming community of nearly 1,500 people was hit by a storm. The impact of the storm, according to the residents, was one of a kind never experienced in the area, although storm incidents are somehow common here. Buildings were ripped off. Trees and electricity poles uprooted, leaving the victims and the animals struggle for shelter. In calling for assistance from the National Disaster Management Organization, the residents blamed the incident on the illegal cutting of trees in the area and demanded action from government. <laughs> The storm was severe because the trees are no more there to play the windbreak function. At the community, we first met with the local chief at his palace. His spokesperson, Samari Bedell, he attributed the storm incident to the indiscriminate cutting of trees and asked government to immediately intervene. We want government to stop the cutting of trees here. We now struggle to get people to remove our buildings. Government must stop them. Government for residents James Salifu, he wants the police in the area to be empowered to be able to fight the menace. At first, the way the wind or storms that are coming, when trees were there, nothing like this has ever happened. This is my first time what I have seen. So I see that it will be good. If they get anyone who is going to cut down a tree and send it out, discipline should come out. I have seen that the down cut of the trees is now affecting us. Even now, some buildings, those trees were helping us to roof our building. But now other buildings are standing, even for them to get wood for the roofing of their houses and then other things is now a problem and that's how we end the air um, news for more news you can go to my joyonline.com my name is mpisa cbd enjoy the rest of your day
Welcome to the news review belt of the AM show. Thank you for staying with us. Mamavi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Last day of the month, April. Tomorrow we enter into May. And I still can't believe that. Like we've done January, February, March, April. Why can't you believe it, though? Is it's it going gone, too fast? It's going... Too quickly? Well, maybe not. I mean, I'm just realizing that we're well into 2021, I guess. Yeah. This year, 20, I mean, January went pretty yeah. fast compared to others. Did it? When you oh, were in yeah. January? Yeah. I mean, it said that there are three months in January, but this time it appeared to be two and a half. Not, not exactly uh, yeah. three. But um, here we are. We thank God for the gift of life. Yeah. Sometimes life is like that. You have the ups and downs, and but you... You breeze through all of it and you thank God for yeah. So we thank God for another opportunity. God be has here. been good. Mm. God has absolutely yeah. been good. Yeah. Still can't believe that we've ended April. We're ending April today. Mm. So yeah, we give him thanks. I don't know how it's been for you watching us. It hasn't been smooth for all of us, you know. Uh, but in all things, we give thanks <laughs> to him. Because so many no things. matter your situation, you are way better off than some other person. You know, so many things happen and mm -hmm. we come here and sit here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all is well. All is well. We See, go. ours is mm -hmm. just the typical Ghanaian story. And it's yeah. the African story, if you like. Yeah. Uh, we all go through our hustles every day. I mean, mm -hmm. every day is a hustle. But the fact that we have life and the fact that, you know, we are well and apt. That's the inspiration, really. Mm. So we hope that, you know, you can go out there. Yesterday wasn't better. Today's another day. We live to fight. We live to fight. Yeah, we live to fight. It is well. Well, before yeah. we dig into the papers, <laughs> quite a collection here. But, uh, Mamavi, mm. those songs mm. of mm. yesteryear, mm. the oldies but mm. goodies, <laughs> which ones did you grow up on? Which ones did you listen to? Was it the Qua Qua do <laughs> No, definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> Definitely not. So on a morning like this, <laughs> I just remember that in the 90s, you know, at a point in time, late 90s, Lord Kenya and uh, Dasibre Jamana. Yeah. You remember that track? Yeah. Um, it, it was just a bomb at the time. Well, not a bomb in a negative way, but it blew up. We're all singing it. Then Kenya goes through his own albums, always talking about money. And then at a point, uh, Ejako Nimo says, uh, I'm referring to Lord Kenya, not Ijaku Nimu himself, says, oh, now he's, he's a preacher man and all of that. We shouldn't even play his songs. And yeah, yeah, lots of controversy there. Interesting times. But I think that, you, you know, you talk about Lord Kenya and you've got to respect that man. Oh, yeah. We've had people go and come, mm -hmm. but he has remained. You, you, you have know? to, if you're considering Obrafo, you have to put him, place him together with Lord Kenya on the same pedestal because back then, they were like the biggest artists until now. I mean, the two of them, if you look at that era till mm -hmm. now, they stand out. Of course, now we have new ones who have come through the Sarkodiers, the T Flows, the yeah. Strongmans, the Medicals on that plane. Oh, I can't forget Manifest as well. I also, you know, quite remember Faria Ponsa, and I, mm -hmm. I think uh, Samini of Faria Ponsa, you know, the whole. Cocovelli, like there are some squad that kind of also stick when I'm thinking about. And the transitions. Uh, late 90s and 20s, uh, 2000s. Yeah. Because some of us, that's our era, really. Yeah. 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 But the transitions as well. Batman to Samini. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, then um, uh, Bandana, Bandana to, to Shatana. Shatana. Wali. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's been some rebranding. Uh, yeah. We're living. It's a Friday and we want you to come along with us. So uh, well, when we get to that spot, I think uh, you're more into it. Uh, who, you, who do, do you remember because you, you, even VIP to VIP did you, did, with, did you with, do with, disco with, and clubbing and stuff like that I, I listened to the music ah. I actually grew up on some of that music okay so Prince Michael Jackson oh wait you, you never like you didn't, you just of course lost that from that of era? Of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> Exquisite, so Papa. Is it the Ghanaian or it is the foreign ones that, you know, does it for you? You know, when we're talking about like throwbacks, mm -hmm. a lot of people kind of tend to remember or we flow with the with the foreign oldies, yeah. not necessarily the Ghanaian, the Ghanaian ones. The Ghanaian oldies as well. Definitely. I mean, the other day when we were playing Aquaba 
featuring his his father, so the Afro boys. I mean, his songs as well. You you hear them and immediately it, it resonates with you. Or Sibisa songs till today. I mean, they're selling out there. And so. I think those were kind of like mid tempo tunes. Mm -hmm. So if you really wanted to dance, then you're probably dancing with some Tupac or you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Watch it, watch it, watch it. <laughs> well, well, listen, we, we'll have a lot of fun later on uh, here on the show, but for now, let's look at what's uh, making the headlines in our newspapers, Ben. Well, I have the Daily Guide, Republic, BNFT, Ghanaian Publisher, and the Meridian. What do you have? The Ghanaian Times, the Daily Dispatch, the Finder, I see the Statesman, and also the Custodian newspaper. All right, I'll start with the Daily Guide this morning. It says, Goyle goes into asphalt. Uh, production that's on page nine quite a development there then fire raging on lottery front that's on page six a lot going on in that uh, sector then this one <clears throat> so to drama agrada sets sikagari on fire and uh, some have been posting uh, reverend Agrada, uh, whether, well, she says she's converted. You can see her in the shot, actually, see, with, that, with, with a, a that, picture, that's the picture problem, with the it? Bible. If somebody carried him or herself as a doctor or a lawyer, would we that will make put, him or her? put that person to the test, we'll probably be prosecuting the person for carrying him or herself, uh, you know, as a person. Meanwhile, the person is not qualified. But there you have it. You can go around today and say that you are this, and tomorrow you are an evangelist, mm. and everybody will call you that's that's how far we have thing come. That's the society that we live in religion is unless someone is infringing on your rights to adhere to some particular belief um with these ones they will tell you that you really can't determine mm. that's what they they, they mm. tell you that's what they say okay but of course the bible also says by their fruits you shall know them so. Yeah, but I think that that's not enough, I mean, for our society. It's not because a person would carry themselves like that and be deceiving people and be counseling people. And so you need to be properly qualified, so-called. Right. right. Yeah, it, it, it has to be a fair kind of system here. If you can't carry yourself, I can't wake up and say, I'm a doctor today. Mm. Ben, I cannot. I cannot go and sit in some room and say it's a consulting room so people should come and consult. Yeah. But I can, I can wake up and say that I'm a bishop or I'm an evangelist and people can come to me for counseling. Yeah, we need to check that. Well, Sikagari on fire. Court puts injunction on Stambik Bank AGM. Find out why on page three. Fast track recycling plants. Uh, that's supporting to some members of parliament. But when you check out the middle spread of the paper, Ikiapim Polo is calling out DKB over 4,000 Ghana CD donation. And this, again, has come... Uh, to the fore, she's saying some of that money she did not get, and this and that. But I think uh, at some point we have to let this matter die a natural death. Kwame Nye MP Berry's late father and rapper Idris Abdul Karim takes on Nigeria's Labour Ministry. He's taking on this uh, Labour Minister, I should say. It reminds me of back then when, what was his name? Uh, remember that song that was banned? Nigeria, Jaga, Jaga, hey, everything's good. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. No, I just remember because you of that. You know, you don't look it, huh? the, You because, don't look it, but the kind of things you listen to and watch. Of hey. The, hey, I beg you. Hey. <laughs> Where you are going hey, there. Man. But, but that song and the, and the furore it by raised at the time. What did you say? <laughs> by their fruits, you shall do them. Ah. Oh, so because of the music I listen to. <laughs> but I'm surprised. Wait, you know the song, right? Uh, you know the song, right? Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> On the back page, rugby players rubbish grouper petition. Daily Guide. You can't say rugby players rubbishes. Uh, that's that's. I'm sorry, but that's that's not proper English. It's it's plural. So, rugby players rubbish grouper petition, and that has to do with uh, a Ghana Rugby Union Players Association, and they've been calling for the head head, I should say, of Herbert. Uh, Mensa. Barca need cash for Messi contract and uh, that's it with the Daily Guide. All right, let's, uh, let's do the Ghanaian Times newspaper and on the front page be aggressive in multimedia space. Minister advises New Times cooperation. Bafo Sayakoto must be honored. MPs raise red flag over water quality around landfill sites. 
we dissociate ourselves from calls to abrogate KGL NLA agreement. Who says that? Details in the paper. So clamp down on crime in Kasua. 340 suspect in police grip. If you go to page three, two boys drowned in uh, an irrigation dam at the Ashaman Agri area in the Greater Accra region last Wednesday when they went there to swim, <coughs> according to an eyewitness uh, who is a mechanic. He was resting at his shop when he heard some people screaming from the dam nearby, so he rushed there. He said when he went to the dam, people there informed him that two boys, identified as Daniel Mante, 13, and Amish Mante, 11, had drowned. Uh, the boys had gone there with three others to cut weeds to feed rabbits, but decided to swim in the dam. Uh, and then, uh, of course, this was in our news. The police yesterday rounded up 340 suspected criminals, including five females in a dawn swoop at Kaswa and its environs in the Ewutu Senior Municipality of the Central Region. Four persons who attacked and robbed a taxi driver of his vehicle, mobile phone, and 630 Ghana CDs have been remanded by the Accra Circuit Court. Their names have been given. Uh, in court, one of them... Uh, who dishonestly received the stolen vehicle and sold it for 5,000 Ghana CDs. So that person, Francis Adi, was also in court. More about how uh, things turned out in court in, on page three in the Ghanaian Times newspaper. On the back page, uh, the sword was on Thursday cats at Abra, uh, Abraba or Abrabra in the Sefiri also municipality of the Western North region for the construction of 10 mechanized solar water systems for rural cocoa growing communities at the cost of $150,000. Uh, details of that here. And government is to expand the Kung barrier to mutual stretch on the Accra Aflau Road into a six lane route. <coughs> the projects include the construction of four interchange points at the Titi Brothers Junction, the Pung barrier, Dawenya to Afienya Junction, and the Pram Pram Junction. The rest of that story is on the back page of the Ghanaian Times. Let's go to the Ghanaian publisher now. And uh, it says, coming up, scandal at Bost. Then there's also this one, Opuni files for no case. I'll just bring you a bit of that story. Lawyers for former chief executive officer of Cocoa Dr. Stephen Kwabena Opuni have filed a submission of no case in the trial where he and two others have been accused of causing financial loss uh, to the state. According to the defense lawyers, the state has failed to prove beyond re reasonable doubt that their client committed the offense for which reason he has been charged. Uh, the submission of no case, which was filed on April 12, 2021, follows the rejection of an oral one that was by Justice Clemens Jackson Honyanuga, a Supreme Court judge sitting with additional responsibilities as a high court judge who asked the defense team to come officially by filing their applications before the court. Of course, this Opuni and uh, Agogo case has been in court for a while. And uh, well, Opuni is filing for a no case. Uh, Neil Ante to waste collectors, cover refuse on your way to disposal sites. And do we even need to be told this? <laughs> is it not very basic, but it appears it's something that those uh, members of parliament have been meeting on and have been speaking about, and that is Nilante's own contribution. No intention to privatize GBC, uh, Opon Kroma, the information minister. He's been interacting with staff of the company, and he's told them to ignore the suspicion that uh, GBC is going to be privatized. And to cl he clearly defines the corporation's identity to remain relevant in the contemporary media landscape. I want to take a bit of a swipe at this one. Don't go to high-risk COVID countries. That's government to Ghanaians. That's also on page two. So that's the latest travel alert. Yes. Mm. And it says, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration has warned Ghanaians who intend to travel to countries with exceedingly high COVID-19 infection rates to postpone or cancel their trip. This, according to the ministry, is in view of the alarming rate of COVID-19 cases in some parts of the world, including Asia and South America. And of course, it's in that statement which stipulates guidelines for essential travel to any of these countries. So a bit of a warning there that we all should take stock of. Police arrest over 300 
I'll just leave it as people in Kaswa without mentioning the nationality. I don't think it's relevant in this case to mention the nationality. And that's it with the Ghanaian publisher newspaper. Let's do the finder. Front page, Ghana records 89% drop in malaria-related deaths in eight years, but infections remain high. Also, the Accra Metropolitan Assembly removes illegal structures and containers at Rollins Park. I see the assemblies uh, carrying out similar projects in my municipality, the West Municipal Assembly. I know that they're uh, also pulling down structures in waterways. Uh, more than 100,000. Now, this is the one that is heartbreaking. Uh, 109,888 teenage hmm. pregnancies recorded in 2020. 2,865 are between 10 and 14 years old. And the Ashanti region takes a lead in this one. Uh, they have a record of 17,802 of those teenage pregnancies, followed by the Eastern region. The Central region follows in that order, Northern Greater Accra, Western Upper East, Volta, Bono East, Bono Oti, North East, Western North, Upper West, Savannah. And we know the effects of teenage pregnancy uh, on the mother itself, a teenage mother taking care of a, a baby. Uh, they they don't know any better how can they take care of another baby uh, give life to another person and teach them and then of course the effects uh, on the child on the society as well uh, and this is incredibly high 109,888 and uh, the kaswa arrest is also featured on page two uh, and then yeah there's a group that's congratulating john kuma <coughs> deputy finance minister Designate. I thought that they would hold on. Uh, he has to go through vetting <laughs> and approval, <laughs> and then they continually congratulate. But this is also not wrong, I guess. All right. Uh, really, pretty much the other headlines we're familiar with uh, the information minister touring and making <coughs> some comments, particularly this one directed at Prince Media. Let's check out uh, Republic Press, and uh, there's a portion that I'll have you read when I when I get to that. Uh, Mama V. Why? Abwaje, for very good reason. For very good reason. Uh, this one says, no politician involved in Galamsey will be spared. That's according to the land minister. No politician, Mama V. None of them will be spared. That's according to uh, Samuel Abujina. Four police officers, three others Is that remanded. that a soundbite, so that's a... Uh... Uh, soundbite, is a <laughs> Uh, it's a question. The Minister for Lands and Natural Resources says no minister will be spared. What's the minister saying? Ah, okay. What will be your matter? Oh, no, I don't have any mm -mm. matter. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, like many other people, we want to see that. Mm -mm. And then we can believe the words. Mm -mm. Yeah, lands, you know. Mm. And I use one. <laughs> Police officers, three others, remanded over secret burial of farmer at Sequa. And uh, Berima Sapong, Alan Chermanteng, is competent. Dr. Baumia is not a disaster. NPP has the men. That's what he has been saying. The story about 300 people grabbed in Kaswa and 250 laptops seized, I shall bring back. It's also here in Republic Press. I'm intentionally not mentioning the nationality because I think sometimes the stereotyping, uh, 300 people have been grabbed. It's okay to mention that. Martin Amidu begins shadow boxing, fights hard to implicate Kisi Ajabing. That's on uh, page four of the newspaper. We started discoursing on this yesterday and it talks about, about how in his latest epistle, uh, Mr. Amidu said he was interested in how legal practitioner and chairman of the electronic uh, communications Tribunal, Kisia Jabing, would independently and impartially handle some corruption cases when he is approved by President Akufuado and Parliament to head his old office. This, according to him, is because of the relationship between the nominee and the individuals or institutions involved in suspected corrupt acts. If you want more details, go to page four of that newspaper. Energy Ministry fires back at minority, and uh, they've been responding to what the minority has been saying, or some of that. Now, let me get to this uh, bit here. Champions League, Real Madrid's Mar Marcello, I should say, could miss Chelsea trip because of election duties. And uh, he has been called up to monitor a polling station during local elections. And guess what? That could mean he could miss 
the semi-final, the second leg of the semi-final. But finally, this is what I wanted you to read out. Uh, confessions. Yes, please go ahead. Read out the headline. For oh, that's, that, that's you reviewing the paper. Why are you giving it <laughs> me to do? I, I won't do that. I've got my own papers. So guys review weirdest <laughs> places they have had intercourse. Yes. And, There's um, confessions there. Would you want to? Yes, also it says confessions. So some people. After it says guys. So yeah. Uh, Let's hear yours. I am not in the mix here. Ah, um, but no. it says confessions. Uh, I have no confession. Okay. All right. Cool. Yes. All right. Uh, but some people talk about movie halls, office, under a waterfall. Under a what? <laughs> under a waterfall. Okay. That's. Uh, in the parking lot. In the parking lot. Is okay. Now familiar. this is weird. Mm -hmm. It says at a friend's wedding. Where? Are the wedding grounds or what? The wedding took place in a garden. I spotted one of the bridesmaids. Oh, and gosh. we had a long conversation. Oh, gosh. <laughs> over two bottles of wine and some shots of whiskey. Okay. Is, is the water whatever? That's the quite adventurous. <laughs> Something you'd like to try? Definitely. Okay. Doesn't sound bad. It's adventurous. You heard it here. Mama Bia Wusu Abwajim would like to. Hey, 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 hey. Under a waterfall. Okay. Uh, if, if somebody is listening. Don't get naughty on the show, A hotel balcony is also in there in the washroom don't as get, well. It's interesting. Don't get so naughty. Do they dispatch now? Hey, Ben. All right, let's just do this. <laughs> the Daily Dispatch newspaper on the front page. Muhammad needed pink sheets to support his case, mm -hmm. not spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And that's according to a Supreme Court judge. I will come to a bit of the details, but there are some four MPs. They're actually on the Select Committee on Local Governments. Uh, they're calling on the NCCE to sensitize people on waste segregation. But this story definitely of interest. Uh, you would hardly hear the judges themselves explain their decision. Uh, and so a justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Gertrude Tokonu, has said the decision of the Electoral Commission to correct anomalies in the declaration of the 2020 election result was in accordance with the law. She said this formed one of the bases for the judgment the panel of justices gave on the just ended election petition. And apparently, according to the story, the NDC, a member of the NDC, had made some claims and uh, Madame Tokonu was speaking at a forum. And um, it didn't quite say, but they gave the CDDs, uh, as in Cordeo's post-election review workshop. And I don't know if that's where she was speaking, uh, but they've got a quote from her. This, and this is direct quote attributed to the judge. There was a spreadsheet alleging vote padding of 4,693 votes in 26 constituencies. And we said we, we would have expected that the pink sheet for those polling stations would have been exhibited to prove the allegation instead of a spreadsheet. Still quoting, the conclusion was that even if one took out these 4,693 votes, it will not impact on the 6 million plus votes that the candidate was dealing with. Unquote. All right, so that's uh, part of what... Uh, the chief, the Supreme Court judge is alleged to have said. The rest of the story in the Daily Dispatch newspaper. So I'll take a headline each from my last two papers, and it's a wrap. The Meridian, uh, Ghana not making list of 100 best companies in Africa due to bad managers. That is according to McDan CEO, uh, Daniel McCauley. And then in the BNFT, tax junk food sweetened beverages to engender healthy living. That's according to Professor Latik. What's your take on that? Tax them so people are forced to It's a good better. call, but you see, here in Ghana, in some parts of our country, people don't eat junk because uh, <laughs> they have a... Uh, and they want to spoil them, themselves. They don't... That's not how it works. So there has to be better research. Why do people eat junk? It's not just... As it looks in, sometimes. In our part of the world, so it tax. it's a bit of flex to eat junk food. Not always. For always. some people, Not always. it's a bit of flex sometimes to eat. It's I don't want cheaper. to cite, but you're when they do the, the buy one, with whoa, 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 and they feel that is mm. good living. But what? actually, you know that eating healthy is more expensive. When they do buy one, get one free, do you know the number of family members who sit oh, down wow. to share? Mm. So that's the immediate past director of nutrition 
at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, uh, Professor Anna Latte, who has urged the government to impose tax on junk, junk food and sugar-sweetened beverages so as to engender healthy living among uh, citizens. She said the nation's nutrition index had been on the decline and urgent steps were needed to arrest that decline. It's a good call, but Very let's not call. do wholesale policy so making. Saying, let's, let's not do wholesale. What exactly yeah, it's just the same thing that I said. It's not... See, on occasions, and when you go to the malls, do you see sometimes the kind of people who come out and that's like once in a long while that they are coming out to buy some of these stuff that we say junk? Mm. And so when you say tax the junk food, do you know what you'll be doing to them? The effect that, that, that will have. Do you know the number of people who have... It doesn't matter how it's, many times it's the like people a privilege are them. It, it it's matters. like a privilege. Right. So Don't it matters the number of times because then as many times as you have it. And we have what? Even childhood obesity is becoming a problem in our country, like it is in some parts of the West and the East. But she is basically saying that tax junk food and sweetened beverages so that the less people buy them, the more we can save them from certain consequences of bad living. So I don't, I don't think we can really pick and choose too much. I mean, she's made it very clear. Tax them. See, that's why I said that it's a good call, but that's a, uh, a wholesale recommendation to an issue and i don't think it should be like that which ones do you think should be left out i'm not sure we have the time to do that yeah we have to go unfortunately you can go to my <laughs> we've got plenty of stories there to share and there you have it uh office of special prosecutor is redundant i listened to john in Debugri <laughs> yesterday on news night on joy fm and you can listen to his position a lot of people will tend to agree with him by the way after all so a bit of the powers of the attorney general that's been given to this, uh, the officer or the office. I mean, at the really, very start, so. that's what people were saying. <laughs> that there are plenty of stories there that, you know, you can read on on myjohnline.com. All right. Well, we'll this sports. is where we wrap up the conversation, but there's a lot more coming your way in sports. And don't you forget about that feature later on the show with Ray Gatti, Ghana's latest NBA star with the Indiana Pacers. Stay tuned for that one. But right now, sports. Good morning. I am Muftar Nabila Abdullahi and this is AM Sports on the AM show. Coming up, Ghana FA has released a schedule of the Black Stars for the next one year. GFA President Ket Okreko appears unhappy with public reaction to a proposed $25 million fundraising for national team assignments. And Barcelona missed an opportunity to move to the summit of La Liga after a 2-1 loss at home to Granada. Earlier this week, the office of the president had a breakfast meeting with the Ministry of Youth and Sports, the Ghana Football Association, and some chief executive officers of corporate institutions in the country. The meeting was to raise $25 million for national teams' preparation and participation in continental and international assignments. The general public has censured the move initiated by the Ministry of Youth and Sports. President of the Ghana Football Association, Ket Okreku, described the reaction as unfortunate. Well, I think it's, it's most unfortunate. It's not really about the Black Stars. It's about the, the football industry. It's about all our national teams. But the truth of the matter is that in sports marketing, you need to identify your most attractive brands and leverage the, the, the strength of the brands. In, in the Ghanaian ecosystem, the biggest brand, the most attractive brand, is the Black Stars and is the GPL. Okay? So we need to leverage that to ensure that we bring more people to be interested in our sport. Kate Okreku added that the Minister of Youth and Sports, Mustafa Yusuf, should be commended and not condemned. Well, I think that it's a, it's a very, very good initiative by the Honourable Minister. Um, the campaign was clearly and is clearly aimed at all our national teams. Um, Black Stars inclusive, can, upcoming can in Cameroon exclusive, World Cup qualification games inclusive. Um, Beginning ending of this year, all our national teams will be in action. We need to start preparing them. Next year is an extremely busy year for all our national teams. So 
that singular effort by the sector minister is right. It's a step in the right direction. We have to support him because football is capital intensive. It is capital intensive. The rewards that come with we watching football is unquantifiable. This is what people must understand. Okay, when we watch football. Even though maybe you may not be benefiting directly by way of money, the benefits is it's amazing. Okay, we derive satisfaction from watching football, and you cannot place figures to, to this. For which reason, every country, every government would always want to support the passion of the people, and this is what the minister and the president of our land has has initiated. The highlight of the meeting was the target of Black Stars winning next year's African Cup of Nations and reaching the semi-final of the FIFA World Cup to be staged in Qatar. And there will be another meeting today as government continue their efforts to raise that $15 million. And next week, Tuesday, there's another one with corporate institution chief executive officers because they were all invited to the presidency for a breakfast. Now, let's take a look at the schedule of the Black Stars as released by the GFA. Effective May 20, the senior national team is expected in Europe to start preparations for the World Cup qualifiers. We take a look at that schedule that was put out by the Ghana Football Association. They say that there's going to be a training camp in Europe and this is expected to be on May 20 to June 2. And Ghana versus Ethiopia will be going to be on June 4, 2021. South Africa versus Ghana is June 12, 2021. Ghana versus Zimbabwe is September 4, 2021. Zimbabwe versus Ghana is September 9, and there was going to be a break for women international window. And after that women international window, Ethiopia will also host Ghana, and this one is going to be on October 8. Ghana versus South Africa is going to be on October 12, another women international window. Then comes the playoff of the World Cup qualifiers, which is going to kick off on November 7. And then the second leg of that playoff is going to be on November 12, another women international window. Then we move to the Champ qualifiers, which is for 2023, starting December 10. And pre-Afcon training camp expected to be on December 20 to January 5, and the tournament itself is expected to start on January 6 and end on February 7. Earlier this week, the GFA launched a juvenile league, a competition designed to unearth young footballers. Former Black Stars captain Steven Apia is a beneficiary of grassroots football. He says that it is a great initiative worthy of commendation. Very, very happy that they launched the juvenile uh, we call it coast that they they wanted to bring it back because standing here this 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 morning I'm I'm a product from from coast and I mean not seeing coast going on I think is very very bad I mean when we look the under 17 the under 20 we can see that we are struggling today because there is no grassroots football so if they they are they are going to start thinking of bringing it back I think that is very very good and. I must say again that the the FA, I think they have, I mean, they have planned well and they know what they are doing. So uh, let's say kudos to them, and we will see what will happen. Well, um, I think whatever is going to start, we we have to support. Uh, we have to promote uh, the ju juvenile football. Some of us, wherever we find ourselves, because we have been there before. We have to talk about it and that's the way that i mean the message will spread and then at the end all of us will be will be seeing i mean players who would tend to to be a big players like what we did so uh i mean being a former footballer and i will still be in football i think these are the things that we wish to see in the future A very good morning to you. Thank you so much for and thank you for the opportunity. The conversation. Now, let, let me first ask: How has it been so far? The, the month of Ramadan, the fast. How has it been? It's been very good. You know, fasting is a spiritual exercise. is mm. is a state is a state extraordinary to anyone, regardless. You can be a Christian. I mean, when you are in a state of fasting, your state is extraordinary because in your connectedness with God uh, and. Uh, astral realm and the spiritual realm mm. is so 
so strong and that gives you a, new, a certain a renewal of energy mm. to be more dedicated to God. And so from the beginning of the month of Ramadan up to now that today we fasted more than two weeks, uh, we still even feel uh, energized and uh, we've begun feeling the nostalgia um, of having to get out of with all the reassurance and the hopes and the blessings. Um, but still, we are thankful to God that he keeps us strong, even in the, in, the, in the midst of COVID. So obviously, this is a month, maybe you could liken it to the Christian or the Catholic Lent. It is a month set aside to uh, foster a deeper spirituality. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, uh, for those who understand fasting, it's, it's, fasting is, is, is a journey at, uh, a journey towards in, in your inner world. It's a departure from your too much concentration on the physical dimensions of life and existence, um, and a concentration into in fact, matters, matters that matter most in the life of any person who connects with the spiritual uh, world. So you can be a Christian, you can be a Muslim, you can be anything. Once you have a concept of fasting, in the state of fasting, there is something special that you do with your, with your, with your, with your creator. Mm. Uh, and I think it's, it's so important. That's why um, if you take, for, for, for Muslims, when we talk of fasting, I like to say that fasting is not synonymous with self-abnegation, mm. um, self-torture, self-punishment, um, self-denial. Self-mortification. Self-mortification like. and all those mm. things. And that's why in Islam you find that in our form of fasting, early dawn meal is taken, but that between the early, early, early dawn meal and the breaking of the fast in the evening, you have a certain length of period where you travel back um, from the hustle and bustle of life, uh, temptations, attractions that break your connection with God, makes you lose con concentration, mm. um, uh, are all given up. And so elementally, it is not just, uh, it, I think it is wrong and it's inadequate for uh, even some Muslims to define <laughs> most, uh, fasting just by way of the abstention from eating and drinking. Right, and, and I was just about to get to that, <laughs> yes. interestingly, because when yes. we fast, and I like to specify yes. what I adhere to, right. not what, because yes. I may not know fully what others adhere to. Yes. Christians generally have their own yes. fast, but before Easter, Catholics also, you know, yes. participate in our own form of fasting, right. which we call Lent. And you are also encouraged that, exactly as you're saying, yes. it's not just fasting with your stomach. Mm. In fact, some people, for certain reasons, cannot fast. And I'll get to that in exactly. Islam as well, because yeah. I know it exists. But you, even certain things that you may watch, certain things that you may say, certain things that you may do, mm. you are encouraged to fast from them. Yeah. Is it same it, in, it, in, in It's in same. It's Islam same. Well? Um, it's like, um, for example, I mean, the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, is supposed to have said that who, whoever fasts, and out of forgetfulness, he takes something that he should continue the fast. So if your definition of fasting is just abstention from eating and drinking, then you get it wrong. Because even, even though he's eating, he's in a state of fasting. Similarly, an elderly person, an elderly man who because of age and, and the feeble nature of his body mm. um, is unable to undertake the pangs of hunger. And so therefore he's allowed to eat but in place of each eating day, he gives charity. Right. <laughs> so, right. so such persons, even though are uh, seen, might be seen eating, but in terms of their minds and their spirits, they are in a state of fasting. Uh -huh. And that is why for me, given all these things, any Muslim who limits, limits the definition of fasting to the elementary abstention from eating and drinking, then gets it wrong. So this is a month, uh, is it the ninth month in the Muslim, month of the Muslim uh, calendar, yeah. calendar that you set aside precisely for this. Now, there are five pillars of Islam and yeah. Ramadan is one of one them. Of them yeah. Just how important is this month, Ramadan, or this pillar of Islam uh, put side by side with the four other pillars? Yeah, um, um, the, 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 the special thing about the month of Ramadan is that the Quran will tell you in Quran chapter 2 verse 183 go, go in that uh, this is the month of Ramadan in which the Holy Quran was revealed. Yeah. So therefore, um, it gives us an opportunity for celebration of the history of the commencement of our guidance. And that is the, re the revelation of the, of the Holy Quran. That revelation also signifies God's 
connection with the world of human experience. And so that also then, then gives a certain holiness um, to the month. And indeed, in the month of Ramadan, Muslims are by dint of the holiness of the month of Ramadan expected to attain holiness. That is why doing anything contrary to the rules and, and rubrics of fasting is a violation of the sanctity and the sacred of, of, of the month. Uh -huh. So that special holiness that comes with the month of Ramadan, especially because of the revelation of the Holy Quran, set it aside. And God said, I have made this one holy and special for you, for your fasting. And therefore, whoever lives, whoever lives to see the month or to live in the moments and the days of Ramadan, let him fast these few number of days. Call them few because it is, it is related to the days of a whole year. So if you take, if you take 30 days, eh, out of how many, how many days making make, make a year? 365 right. days, you find that it's just a minimum number of, so the Quran says a, fasting a minimum number of days, mm -hmm. but it makes it so incumbent for you so that you can experience the holiness that happens in the month of uh, Ramadan. Holiness that manifests in your total being. Right. In your total being. Um, that is why, I mean, for example, to the total being, that is your total being and how it responds, especially how it resonates with divine attributes of peace and love, uh, for example. That's why I said that when you are fasting, when you are fasting and somebody provokes you, insults, the word they use is when you are insulted. And insult, to insult is to provoke, it to say something that is hurtful. And it is naturally evokes a certain emotional response. Uh -huh. But because at that time you are so special, you are in total control of your sentiments and, and emotions. The animal side of you that makes you so vengeful is tamed. Mm. And so you are a special person. You don't react. And that is our contribution to the total peace of the world. To bring the world to a state of peace and harmony. That, and I have said in my sermons that in this month, I pray that in any Muslim country, we don't hear the blast of a bomb or the trigger of a gun, the wow. spill of a blood, the raping, the raping of women, um, the killing of children in any Muslim country. In fact, beyond, the, beyond this month, because you see, the virtues of Ramadan is to, supposed to carry us. So Ramadan leaves us full, having purged us of those animal things inside us. It fills us with the, with the, with the, with the loads of virtues. Those virtues are what we are filled with in order to live and to proclaim and to demonstrate those divine attributes. Right. That is ex exactly. I feel disappointed that we fast every year and when it comes to anything that is wrong, we, we are found also, also, also involved in it. Mm. And I told him in, in my sermon that I want to see a difference between my fast and when I was seven years old. Was, Typically, any child born and bred within the Zungo community and the Muslim community begins fast early in his life. Right. As early as age six, seven, we are fasting. But I ask the question, what's the difference between my fasting when I, was, when I was seven years old? Now I'm more than 60 years. What is the difference between my fasting when I was seven old and my fasting now that I'm more than 60 years right. old, I'm getting close. What is the difference? Mm -hmm. that, ex that understanding must give us an ex ex certain experience that makes us distinctly different from any other other, other person in terms of our behavior right and 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 the way we you see the way we we deal with the whole of the mm. of the world even at the heat of provocation when in the month of Ramadan something happens to us mm. you go on social media <laughs> you hear <laughs> you hear things that in my view does not resonate with, that, right. with our spirit because at that time our emotions are well controlled mm. and we can take our time listen to things very well and look at which is the best approach to be able to handle uh, matters. That is how I feel, and that's how my experience, and that's how I want every Muslim so in this special month to be able to tame that aspect of us mm. that makes us shout. Huh? He said, when you fast, he said, don't shout at people. Don't engage in indecencies, and that when you are insulted, when you are insulted, he said, tell the person who insults you, I am fasting. This expression is figurative. 
<laughs> it's lucrative. I mean, you know, if, if I walk on the street, I, they're close to join you now. Eh? And I meet anybody, I, when you meet me, I say, oh, I'm fasting. <laughs> and, you know, you pro I'm fasting. Yeah. Eh? I'm fasting. I mean, I'll be, I'll, I'll be considered a mad person. But it's to let the person know. Exactly. You know there is a certain, certain, certain expression that your body, your whole being demonstrates the very state in which you are. And that's, that's what makes you a, a, a different person. Mm. It's, it's a different and, thing. And, and speaking of that difference, it's so uncanny sometimes yeah. how both with Christianity and Islam, some of these things weave into one another. Because as you spoke about comparing your fast as a child to yes. what you do now. Yes. You remember that portion of uh, you know, the Bible where uh, St. Paul actually mm. is speaking and he says, when I was a child, I... I behaved like, like a child, spoke like a child, acted like a child. But now I am grown. And of course, there are differences. It also talks about the faith as a baby and the faith yes, yes, to, yes. to, to adult. Faith, so faith grows. Very faith, similar. Faith, faith is dynamic. Mm. Um, it grows. That is why, you see, in Islam by law, when you are a child, the, the pen of destiny that determines your rightness and, and wrongness is lifted off you. You are not held responsible. Mm. Because at that time, you are a child. Mm. You are a child. You attain, you attain age of majority, then now you are mature. Now God focuses on you. This is my servant. I give him law, commandments. I, I teach him virtues. And I want him to see based on his own submissive volition. And his own submissive volition, now he must behave as a true servant. So I give him a commandment. And once he's able to obey that, then he becomes the true Muslim. Well, the true Muslim is the one who submits, surrender mm. completely to God. Mm. And in the, in the state of fasting, your whole faith and everything is, is brought, you know, under complete test, under complete test. That's when you demonstrate truly that unto your God, you are an honest servant of God. But let me ask you this. You spoke about growing up in the faith very briefly. I was, I was talking about this only a day or two ago mm. that We've had a lot of Christians in key positions in our country, even as we talk about the faith and some who have even left this country and that if we are where we are, it is because we have failed even in the observance of our faith. Yeah. How do you find it when you also see Muslims, for example, who get key into key positions and don't deliver what the people expect or who are even you know, embroiled in some form of corruption and yeah. all that? Yeah. How does it make you feel? No, no, I, the disappointment is, is great. And I can see that it's disappointment myself. I feel it and I observe it. Uh, I have told myself that um, I can't see the connection I mean, between um, Islam and, it, and its virtues uh, and the reality of our lives. Uh, you come to the Zongo community, for example, Muslim community, you can't count the number of mosques. You can't count it. Every, every early morning you hear the blaring of the, of the horn of the, or the microphone calling Allah wa Akbar we. We come every month, every month of Ramadan, we are fasting. We are going on Hajj and coming back. In fact, even in Hajj, we, we cast stones at the Satan. Mm. Huh? And then we come home, and then the, the contradiction now shows, shows up. We are, I mean, the one who doesn't believe in our religion, let's say, he doesn't care about God, about the, I mean, he's killing, he's stealing. And we're also killing, we're also stealing. He is corrupt, we are also corrupt. So where lies the difference? So where lies the difference? Mm. But that once we, we claim to be those who walk on this path, we, our life must show the difference. Yeah, and I tell uh, the, the larger Muslim community, there is a certain um, textual reference to the, on the Holy Quran which says that you have been made, you have been made, according to that text, uh, the best of nations ever raised for, for mankind. Because you enjoin what is righteous and prohibit or prevent what is evil and that you have faith in God. What it means, my understanding is that Muslim community is a, is, a, is a community commissioned by God with an assignment to be the hope of the world whenever the world is drifting away from matters of morality, like we are seeing now. I mean, we have we sunk in so low, huh? I find it painful, disappointing, embarrassing that in a world of today, we see children less than 20 years can invite call, beckon, their own associate, mm. Huh? Mm. their own associate, somebody they have eaten together with, they know he is somebody they are familiar with. Going to eat and then the house. they plot in their mind that because they, for pecuniary motive, mm. they want to kill him and they invite him. Innocently he goes and truly they execute their, their plan. Yeah. They hit him with a club or hit him with, with, with a metal. They kill him and bury him 
That is the world. You see how the, how the world has sunk. And in a moment like this, you need a certain kind of uh, strong wind of virtuos virtuosity mm. that comes to remind the world and push the world away from evil and towards the... So, if I, if I see any Muslim doing the wrong thing ar ar around this time or any other time, I say, okay, um, well, he said he might be all right, but it is disappointing. So if I see a, a Muslim minister, for example, and he's caught by corruption, I feel disappointed. Mm. I want him to be somebody who will be trustworthy because in fasting, in fasting, you are also taught clear conscience and honest service to one nation. The Muslim politicians must understand politics as a means to render service by taking political authority. Mm. It is not for profit. And that's why today uh, I was at a in, in a meeting and we we're all debating the, the, the rising cost of, of, of political campaigns. Mm. And when that happens, it also affects the way we manage our own resources. Mm. Yeah, so, so I want to see a Muslim politician who resists this temptation that he comes to office and he doesn't come to office because he wants to make profit out of political authority. But he sees politics as a means by which he can render service. That is true political service. That's the politics of integrity. We don't talk of political corruption. Where you come and uh, you do what you call sacrifice for, uh, for self mm. and not sacrifice of self. You sacrifice for self and not sacrifice of self. Mm. If you sacrifice for self, it means that you are doing something, sacrifice here in order to get it, to, to, to get it here. You, you spend all giving money and so on and so forth, only that when you come to office, you exploit the circumstances of the office in order to make, to make profit. And I think that um, Muslims and Christians, I listen to Christian preaching, and I think when it comes to matters of virtues, preaching virtues and righteousness, I think, I think that we, we, we share common, common, common values. Right. So I feel disappointed any time when that thing, that thing happens. Right. Yeah. And so we're having a discussion on Ramadan, on uh, this month of fasting when it comes to our Muslim uh, brothers and sisters. And we're getting a lot of insight here uh, being shared by Sheikh Aramayal Shaib, who actually is spokesperson for the national chief imam and a man of great wealth when it comes to uh, the Muslim uh, faith. But Sheikh, the interfaith setting in our schools is one that we have beautifully executed for a long time. I remember back in Bishop Herman, you know, in the boys' school, same happened. The Muslims were doing their thing, praying, we were doing our own thing. But in recent times, uh, and we'll get back to the bit about right. Ramadan, a few more things I'd like us to look at. But we heard of that case mm. where a father had to drive from here in Accra all the way to the Wesley Girls High School to interact with the school's authorities over his daughter who was supposedly not being allowed mm. to practice her faith in terms of observing Ramadan, the fast. I know the Muslim caucus in parliament has had some sort of engagement yeah. with uh, you know, the, the Methodist church, but what is your take on that? What is your understanding of the matter? What message do you want to put out there? Well, I... I I was at a down when this information came to me, and I, I was very cautious dealing with it. One, I'm very particular before I react to these matters. I want to hear, I want to hear the, 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 the truth. Exactly, what exactly did the headmistress say? Right. I, I want to get it from her directly. Madam, did you say, did you say the child should stop the fasting or she is withdrawn from the school. Is that exactly what the, what the headmistress said? Okay. Because I have not heard this, um, some audio and other, other things, I was very cautious mm -hmm. in order to. Secondly, I was also cautious not to generalize. Not to generalize. Why? Because as I sit down here, I'm a proud product of an Anglican mm -hmm. training college. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't shy away from saying this in public. Which one? The Sefioso Training College. Okay. Sefioso. And when I meet the Anglican bishops, I tell them, the Bishop, <laughs> do, do you know you trained me as a teacher? <laughs> uh, and uh, Bishop Akrofi, wherever you are, I mean, the, the day I told him this, he jumped and hugged me. <laughs> <laughs> you see it? So I have been a beneficiary 
of a Christian mission, mission school mm. um, and training me as, as, as a teacher. Um, as I speak to you now, I know the situation in Presec. Muslims in Presec are treated very well. They are treated very well. So if this matter has come, I would not want to generalize. Yeah. And as if that all Christian schools are mistreating. But I, all, I know that there are some of the schools where still Muslim and Wesley girls uh, have been on record for a long time. Mm. Um, we had to establish the fact, one, we are told- they've been on record for a long time. Yeah, for a long time that Muslim students there are not being given one, they are not allowed even to say their prayers. Um, you come to the school, five prayers of the, the, five, the, the five prayers. You come to school, they see a copy of the Quran, and they would either take it and throw it away, or somebody will seize it. You know, the psychological tr uh, trauma that they are taking through because your whole identity. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, the CSSPS system had placed you, mm. uh, you know, in such a school. No, you, make a, you made a choice, but that you have been placed there mm. as some, a child who is a citizen of this country and has a right to education, education which is a lifeline to successful life. Mm. And yet, you find, I mean, somebody who, by either by the dictator of the faith or whatever, uh, claim of discipline or, or whatever, says that, look, we will not allow you. Or I hear some of them will have to stand on their beds and say their prayers because, uh, and then, wow. yes, yeah, and then the latest one that is that, which I am yet to establish that the girl is going to fast and then she's been asked not to fast. If she forces to fast, then she will be withdrawn. Uh, and then the father comes. I discussed with the chief imam. Actually, it, it, chief imam himself has drawn my attention to this in his inner chamber during the time when this uh, Rastafarian issue came up. Right. And this issue of Muslims also now took advantage and came up. So he asked me to make some findings. I had to now talk to the president of the Ghana Muslims Association to give me the list of schools. All the schools where Muslims are having problems. Right where they are not having problems, mm -hmm. so that we will know and be specific. If it's Wesley College, then we must talk of, about Wesley College. Mm -hmm. If it's St. Mary's, then we must talk about St. Mary's, right. so that we don't use the same brush to paint all um, schools. the schools. We were in that process when this one also came to add to it. Anytime Chief Mam hears this, he feels disappointed, he feels worried, um, and um, when he calls and talks to me, uh, it's like, well, these are the people that they hail praises on me. They show me great respect any time. But my grandchildren are in, the, in their schools, and my grandchildren are not treated well. I mean, he feels, yeah. But meek, meek as he is, the chief man will never tell you, go and shout, go and do that. But that, he feels disappointed. And I feel disappointed if truly, I have been a teacher. And I understand the psychological implications of this. Any child you mistreat in the, within the school system, the psychological impact on his being as he grows further, mm. just like a child who is abused in the house for too long, or a child who is exposed to abuse, he sees his father slapping his mother, kicking his mother with foot, that child will grow to become a violent person when he, when he gets married. The same thing, any child who is mistreated, treated with indignity, disrespect, mm. his, uh, his rights are abused, that child will grow never to see anything wrong with the abuse of human rights. Right. And I think that as teachers, even within the mission, I mean, within the mission, we are told that compassion is something that we all we, we uphold. And I find a contradiction. When Muslim children are in Christian schools, and Christians who uphold the virtue of compassion and respect for human dignity mm. will not be able to look at within the frame of their discipline mm. to also respect the diversity in it. And say, so, oh, these are Muslim children. We are happy. We are, we are making contributions into their lives. And I, there's one, one, one of our very respected Christian clergy during our debate on this issue of hijab at Kofi, Kofi Annan, when the other Christian clergymen were so hard, refusing to understand, this respected clergyman, I don't want to mention his name. You know he, what he said? What did he, he say? Remind, he reminded the, the Christian uh, uh, pastors who were there. Just said, my, my brothers, you know, gone were the days when we established these schools for evangelization. Mm. Now we establish these schools in order to educate. Mm. In order to educate. That respected Christian clergyman who was the chair of that sitting at Kofi Annan, this is what he told his colleagues. 
You see, I want to be able to, like I'm speaking now, to also stand and defend any Christian child who is mistreated. Because under me are Christian children. In my house, I live with Christian children. Mm. My wife brought them and they have remained with me up till this time. Mm. On Sunday, they don't go to church. I ask them, hey, no, no, oh, 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 sorry. I ask them, oh, 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 sorry. In Easter, I give them gift for their Easter. Mm. Yeah, up till now, my, my, my wife died year, year, years back, but the children she brought from her workplace are still living with me. So, so, so let, me, let me find out from you, Sheikh. In, in supporting what Wesley Girls has done, in, yeah. in backing up, in giving some reason for what they did, they indicated that okay. this is a general rule. It doesn't matter whether you are Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's a general rule applying to everybody. Right. And they also say that in this specific case, it is for the health mm. of the children. Right. Those in the school. Mm. And of course, I know that in Islam, even in terms of fasting, sometimes if there are health reasons, yes. you are not allowed to fast. You've yeah. made mention of that. Does that suffice as a reason? No, it doesn't suffice because, look, uh, these children are children who have been brought up and they understand what this fasting means. Huh? They know when you are sick, you don't fast. They know. But once the child is not sick, the child is not sick, and he's able to also go through the day's activity mm. without showing any, like I told you, I fasted. Yeah. <laughs> I fasted. The, the, the father of girls says she started fasting as early as 80 years. 80 years, like, so, look, at, every, at least just to give that, every typical Muslim child rise, living in the Zongo begins fasting. Because before us, then it becomes part and parcel of our lives. Let the girl do it, observe her, and see whether it's affecting her. What are the health implications? I mean, people do fasting uh, for health reasons. Mm. You go to some of, some of the situations where a doctor will ask you to, to do fasting because he wants to improve your health. Look, it sounds bizarre, and I think that the authority in the school should not go stupid, it's just low to give it such distance. Um, one of the things that I mean, I, with the Rastafarian, my viewpoint was that uh, probably we didn't anticipate a growing diversity. So even though even our constitution has given us framework for respecting diversity, telling us that the right to believe, to profess a religion, and the right to manifest the religion has been, has been said. So it means our constitution has anticipated right. a certain diversity. Right. Uh -huh. So it That's is the right. of the constitution. Exa exactly. But maybe in our minds, mm. In the minds of most institutions, they have not been ready to accept that growing diversity. So, so, so it's a certain mindset right. of a certain, look, I, as I, I was at Legon, at Legon I was a bit radical. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, deliberately I was disturbing, I was disturbing our, my, my whole tutor. <laughs> because in all the halls of residence, the institution at that colonial administration never anticipated one day mm. Muslims will be part of that system or any other religion. Mm. So they provided chapels in all halls of residence, okay. where Christians could go there. Now so, you have a growing number, you ask for a place, small place to worship, and they see that's bizarre, strange. So uh, Sheikh, let, this let, one coming from? let's do this. <laughs> you've, you've made mention of the fact that the chief imam is unhappy about this. Very, very unhappy and disappointed. Uh, 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 you have a list of schools that are not allowing uh, Muslims mm, to... Yeah, but I wish I, if I knew this... About, about, about how many are they? Just, just very briefly, about how many schools are... On um, I think that the schools that I have received where these things are, are going on, are more, more than about 20 schools. More than 20 yeah, schools? Yeah, I mean, these things are scattered across the, across the, country. the, the, the country. Good. So, so uh, what are you going to do about it? Well, Chief uh, Imam, um, what are you going to do about it? That's, I, that's how we're I believe that in, such, in, in, in circumstances of diversity, to establish harmony, dialogue is key. Dialogue, dialogue is key. I, I respect the Christian community that they build their schools in order to promote their virtues and values. And that must be respected. Uh -huh. But given that we are in a situation where such schools have also become public schools, I think we need to dialogue around um, how do we treat people of different faith traditions who are in these schools within the framework of what is the school's rules of discipline. Okay. Uh, that you'll be able to do this. I do not support the adversarial approach, conflict, shout, and those things. I think that I will go with the chief mom's approach that one, we appeal to 
the Christian the mission schools, the, the, the authority of the, all the Christian mission schools. Okay. The chief imam is saying that those children in their schools are his grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And the way they accord him all the respect and the accolades and the reverence they accord him, they should also look at that same thing and accord his grandchildren similar treatment of dignity. Okay. Whenever there is any problem, then from there, I think the National Peace Council was also given, which I remember now, was given the assignment to um, facilitate dialogue between the Muslim community and the Christian mission schools mm -hmm. to look at how really we must all get to address this thing so that when we can address it once and for all, it will be helpful because it okay. has security implications. Mm. The anger, look, I receive insults a lot. When these things happen, even I, as I'm speaking this way, I receive insults. I said, in other words, I'm not coming out to shout, to talk, to attack. They don't see me do, doing that. Uh -huh. So the anger is something that terrorists can exploit. Mm. I have no doubt in that. Let us not provide a soft spot for terrorists to, see, to say that Muslims are mistreated in Ghana and so therefore they can recruit. Mm. I tell the Minister of National Security, <clears throat> it's a matter for national security and they must get involved. And that's how we end this conversation. It's a matter for national security. That's how important it is. Let's not open the way for terrorists uh, to exploit the situation. Sheikh, we are ever grateful whenever we call upon you. Thank you so much. I think it's only fitting to say peace be unto you. Peace be unto you and too. And <laughs> remain brothers and sisters. Yes. And hopefully this matter of the 20 schools will be... Uh, yeah, we'll find, we'll find a way out, inshallah. Sheikh uh, Aramayal Shaib is... Uh, spokesperson for the National Chief Imam. And he joined us this morning and maybe we'll have uh, more such events when it comes to Ramadan. But coming up next on the AM uh, show, the Amasaman Accra uh, stretch has been notorious for traffic. What exactly is causing it and what can be done about it? Mamavi Ousu Abwaji has been on that beat and she actually has this report. We're telling the story of the Amasaman traffic, the causes, and of course, how we can fix it. Here's DSP Vincent up here. He's the MTTD commander in charge of this area. Um, so thank you so much for your time. You're uh, we've been observing the traffic situation for a while, and we've realized that the roads are a major factor because of the bad nature of the roads. Vehicles are not able to flow freely when they get to a certain point. What has been your own observation? Well, uh, my observation is that the long traffic we've been experiencing on the Isawam to Amasaman stretch of the road is as a result of three factors that I have identified. That is road engineering, road engineering, this behavior of uh, the commercial vehicle drivers, that's the trotro taxi drivers, and then pedestrian crossing. Then, of course, the fourth one I will add is, is police, police access. Yes, it's, it's also another factor. But the road engineering actually takes about 60% of the cost of the traffic on the road. This is because there is a, a, a pothole just at uh, Amasaman bus stop. Very big pothole, as you can see. So, when the vehicles get here, they are not able to move. Especially the long tracks. As you can see, when they get here, they have to slow down. The big tracks will slow down. Even the small cars will also have to walk, slow down. If you look forward, you can see that the street is moving. It's moving. It's because of this place. That is why the vehicles are not able to come. Do you understand? So if this place is fixed, if this place is fixed, we wouldn't experience, we wouldn't experience heavy traffic like that. Because when we are directing traffic, we normally give priority to the main road. So when we open for the Sawam Accra vehicles to move, 
more vehicles to be allowed to move. So you wouldn't see traffic. But right now, even when we open for them to come, because of here, they will not be able to read the traffic light. As you can see, there is space there. So this is the major factor. The bad nature of the road here. That is causing the heavy traffic from Isawam to Amasama. Okay. Then I also mentioned the total damage. Yes. As you can see, they, they are they are flat there, you know, and then the the bus the bus stop is already full. Okay. It's already full. So those who are coming, they will not get a place to park. Yeah. So they are compared to park on the one lane of the road. That's blocking those who are coming. So they will not be able to uh, move freely. As you can see that vehicle there, it's stuck on the road. This one, it was a place to park, but there's no space. So it is slowing down the movement of the vehicle. You can see the bus there. So that is the second factor. And then the pedestrian crossing. If you can see from your back, you see that people are crossing from that end. People are crossing from that end. Can, can we take a walk a little? Because after you talk about that situation, I also want to show you something that I've okay. observed over the yeah. period. So the pedestrian crossing, as they are crossing, the vehicles will be stopping for them to cross. So the vehicles will not have the chance to move. And then if you go forward, the same thing. You also know have a place. So the, the crossing is also hindering the free movement of traffic. Then the last one I talk about is the absence of the police. Yes, that one, I agree. If we have enough policemen and we detail them on duty here, they will be able to control the activities of the total drivers. Yeah. Hey. So in this case, when a total or a taxi gets there, he will not stand there for long. You only drop passengers, pick passengers, and then move. Okay. But right now, because we are not there, when they come, they get stopped there, and then they will be loaded, preventing other, you know, drivers from having to place to walk. To pack, uh, load and offload passengers. Okay. So, that is what we have. Okay. That is what is actually causing the heavy traffic from the south to the Amas Amas. Yeah. Okay. So this is the, the spot where you talked about the pedestrian crossing. crossing. Yeah. So this is supposed to be the the thing that slows vehicles down, but yeah. obviously they yeah. don't slow down. Yeah. And then you find the long tracks yeah. just crossing here and overturning all the time. That's a result of the the port goes there. Okay. You know, when they get there, they don't see it early. So the moment they see it, uh -huh. and they, they, they want to swerve it, before we realize, <laughs> they lose balance, and then the vehicle turns. <laughs> and, and then the vehicle turns. And that is what happened to the tanker, and then the oil truck that we are talking yeah. about. He didn't see the port. By the time he saw the port, he tried to swerve it, but he lost balance. Yes, so it's the same thing. So again, the problem is the road. Yes. So if the port roads are fixed, I think it will, it will solve okay. it. Okay. Let's talk about the, the pedestrian crossing again. Yeah. Where you also say it's one of the factors slows down the vehicles. Yes. So here too, as you see, as they are coming, they are coming individually. Uh, you see that this one it has stopped. You see that the vehicles have stopped. Uh -huh. You see that they have stopped for the people to move. There is moving. Others are coming. When they also get there, the vehicle will stop. So, <laughs> for the whole period, almost about every three minutes, they have to stop for the pedestrians to walk, to move. But all is as a result of the bad nature of the road here. If the vehicles are moving faster, you know, it will restrain the people from crossing by heart. But because the traffic is not moving, they also get advantage to move. So you can see, just about three minutes ago, you see that the vehicles have stopped. And then they have to cross. You understand? So here, 
Either we, we put the police here or even the community policing assistants who have been helping us. But normally, the community policing assistants, when we put them, the drivers don't obey them. Yeah. But I'm just, I was just going to say that for some reason today, I don't see vehicles driving on their shoulders, but there's one that's pulled his face yeah. coming right there. Yeah. But again, the absence yeah. of police, otherwise, yeah. this will not be happening. Yes. And it's also because of the road. So if the road is, is moving, obviously they, they, they will not do that. But when we get a police around, they will also not do that. So with all these things, they need police presses. How are we going to get police everywhere? So we as drivers, we have to behave responsibly. You understand? We have to behave responsibly. You, you can't line up police on the road everywhere. It's impossible. So we have to be responsible to ensure that we do the right thing. That, that vehicle like this, we are not better than those who are on the road. So why do you want to pass on the shoulders of the road? Because the police are not there. You know, it's, 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 it's unacceptable. Yeah. Yes. So let's talk about the, the things that you can fix because you're the commander in charge. I know that you don't have all the men to put on the road. Uh, but since we've identified some hot spots, at least, in the interim, what are you doing to fix it? Yeah, in the interim, what we are doing to reduce the traffic by 40%, as I told you, in my own estimation, by 40%, we need additional personnel to control the situation. Which I have already done. Yes, I have informed my authorities and they are taking the necessary action to give us some men, at least for now, to manage the areas. I have, I have identified the areas that we need the men in place okay. so that the traffic will move. So if we get a man, we we'll put them at those places. And I can show you that it will, remove, it will reduce the traffic from Sawam to Amasamai by 40%. Uh, but as we've been standing and talking, I realize that the traffic is still building up. So what time does it get better? From well, I mean, 11 up to about 2 p.m. Then the road will get a bit free. So now that we're familiar with the challenges as outlined by the Amasaman MCTD police commander, I have the MCE, the municipal chief executive, uh, who will give us answers to the many challenges outlined. Uh, so I would like to say thank you so much uh, for making time, Mr. Wilkinson. Uh, first of all, this pothole, that's almost looking like a manhole. When is it going to be fixed? Because we see that it is the main cause of the traffic, at least when you get here. It's slowing down vehicles because once they move past this, they flow. So this is a problem. So when are you fixing it? Um, thank you very much. Um, as you said, uh, when I'm not fixing it, the road has been awarded to a contractor and the contractor is already on the road. But um, um, there was a little challenge um, that is why the contractor put a stop to it. And I'm sure yesterday um, I met the director of highway and he promised that in the next month they are coming to do the party so that the cars can flow on the road. When you say next month, is it May or June? Oh no, we are in April, right? Yes. So May, that is May. And they are coming to do that. You know, we, we have cleared the women from the roadside and all of us we are aware that before the traffic was so heavy but now because we have cleared the women from the roadside and the cars are getting the space to park it's making everything easier for them but because of the potholes so the cars slow down on the road and that is why we are having a little traffic this morning today is wednesday and you know mondays wednesdays there's a huge traffic on this particular road so that is what we are seeing now. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure when the roads are a little bit packed and we don't see those um, potholes, the traffic will stop. Yeah. How does it make you feel, especially last week when people were stuck in traffic for hours, just crossing Amasaman to Pokwase? And we've always known that this is a challenge. Why do we wait to get people frustrated? This road is about 17 kilometers from Ufanko to Insawem, 18 kilometers rather. And the 18 kilometer road has been awarded to a contractor. Which, 
the, the minister we assembly. Don't, we don't see the contractor on the yeah, site. Yeah, but which the minister assembly have a limited action taken on it. But um, we are doing our best. At times, we we'll, we'll just pick a, 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 a tipper truck to do some fillings. But those fillings will not last even two days or three days. It will wash away. Right. So now we are, we are appealing to the contractor as well. I being the municipal chief executive, oh, I'm, I'm saying that I'm appealing to the contractor. It should come to our aid because this is a gateway to Accra. You can see the cars that are coming. Every morning, I can, I can tell you a lot of heavy trucks come around, tipper, heavy trucks, and people are coming all along from the 11 ranges of the country. Then they'll go through Amasaman. So we are appealing, we are appealing to the contractor to come around and help us to solve the problem. Here we are now at the main Amasaman traffic lights, still connecting from Insawem to Pokowase. Uh, the MTTD police commander is still with me, DSP Vincent Apia. And this is a hotspot, uh, DSP, because if you look across where there's also another terminal, that lane gets so full that late afternoon you see that they've also taken another side of the road. How are you fixing this issue? Yeah, that issue is also as a result of uh, the misbehavior of commercial vehicle drivers. You know, that place is supposed to be a bus stop and not a station. But when they get there, some of them want to park there and be loading. So for several minutes, they are there. So when other vehicles come, they don't get a place to move in. So as usual, we need the police to control them. Uh -huh. So it forms part of the request that I have made. So when we, are, we get men, we will detail police matters, especially in the evening, from 2 p.m. up to 7 p.m. So that we we'll make sure that no vehicle stands there to load. When you come, you drop your passengers. If there are passengers there, you pick them, then you move. So when the police is there to push them from there, there will be space and the vehicles will no longer queue on the road. So that is the plan we have for it. When we get a man, that area to we will attend to it. Okay. Yes. I would, I would ask the MC about the market because there's also a market there. And I don't understand why there's a market there. There's a market uh, inside the township itself. And then you see the hawkers also come to the roadside sometimes. Is All this right. a temporary marketplace or this is permanent? This is an unauthorized market. Unauthorized? Uh, yes. So unauthorized. it's illegal? Yes. They it's are there illegally? Um, unauthorized market. So why are you tolerating them? No, we are not tolerating them. You know, they are a little bit hiding from... Even if you are not careful, you won't see, right? So when contractor, uh, I mean, get rid of the shoulders of the road, those people, were, they are there. And it's, it's, it's good for us now because we are still preparing a place for them. It's better than they being at the shoulders of the road. Okay, so you don't yeah. have a place for them? Not yet. We are, we are now preparing the place for them. And those here, we have asked them to go to the main market. Because the main market is empty. They came to the roadside and now they have gone. But those people here, we, are, we have asked them to be there and we are going to make sure we are going to get a better fit for them. Right. Okay. Let me go back to the commander uh, on, the traffic, on the traffic issues. Uh, this is the main uh, traffic light where we see pedestrians crossing. We see vehicles also make a U-turn. Is there a plan for this U-turn because it also causes traffic? We see the big buses, the Ayalolo and the STC also make their turn here. Is there a plan? Yeah, um, right now what we have decided, the right time we met the assembly, we, we, we made that discussion that if we can close this U-turn, because my information is that this U-turn was initially not there. Vehicles from Accra entering Samoum, I mean Amasama, will have to go to Toma and take the U-turn from there. But when they created the Ayalolo terminal, then they opened this place for them. So you can see that it is causing a lot of traffic because the nature of the road in Amasama town itself is very narrow. It's very narrow. So vehicles are not able to, to park anywhere. So if these people also join in here, 
they go to add up and they are not able to move. So they end up blocking traffic from Sawam to Accra. Uh -huh. So not until there is space, not until there is space for them to move into Amasama, we don't allow them. But before you realize the traffic has gone as far as to Pokwasi, because the traffic is not moving inside Amasama. Uh -huh. So we have discussed it with the assembly that if this u turn can be closed so that we shift it to Toman. Uh -huh. But that too, they need to actually fix you know, the u turn properly so that the vehicles can easily move. If they do that, I think it will ease the traffic at this intersection. Okay. And I have to ask you a personal question though, uh, because I see that you have few men, but you're trying your best to fix the, the challenges with the traffic. Uh, what kind of toll does it uh, have on you and your men? Trying to manage with a few personnel, uh, with the, I mean, for how long can you be standing here and be helping people cross because the traffic lights are not working? All right. Uh, one, uh, in the long term, in the long term planning, I think uh, Amasama needs a footbridge. Needs a footbridge. Maybe they are about to construct the road. Maybe because of that, they may not do it. Maybe when they are constructing the, the new road, then maybe they will, they will put up a footbridge. I don't know. But if the road is not going to be done now, I think we need a footbridge to ease you know, the pedestrian crossing. And then we are challenged with personnel. As you are saying, we have very few personnel. And they come to stand here for a longer period. Uh, as I'm saying, for now, we don't even run charge office. The charge office for the MTTD, we have collapsed it, and we brought them to the traffic. So even accident investigators are seriously complaining because they have to go out to do accident investigation, attend to victims, go to hospital, the cause, and then when they come, they made their entries in the dockers, and then they have to enter it in the station diary, which is supposed to be done by another person. They are always complaining, but I made them to understand that because of the nature of the traffic situation, we have to, they have to bear with us for now. Once we contain the traffic situation, we have informed the authorities when more men are brought, we will actually do that. And then if also when more men are brought, as I indicated earlier, we will be able to bring the traffic down at least by 40%. And the 40%, as I stated, the bus stop there. We will put policemen there to check the commercial vehicle drivers. Do you understand? Morning and then evening rush hours, we will put there. There is also bus stop here, as you can see there. The police also need to be there. Can we, can we? As you can see, the vehicles are not moving. It's because the truck drivers are parking there and they are loading. So we need the police there to control them so that the road will be free for the vehicles to move. Then if you come here, the same thing in the evening, we need the police to be around there so that they can control the throttle drivers to make sure that they don't load at the bus stop. You drop and pick and move, but they don't stand there and use it at a station. So when the police, more men are brought, we, 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 we will detail personnel there and they will control them. And then here is a pedestrian crossing. Where in, we are standing. Yes, where there's a pedestrian crossing, the bus stop. So as they come down, they will be crossing anyhow. From here to there, everybody is crossing. Yeah, but if there is somebody to control the pedestrian, what he will do is to what? Encouraging the drivers to move at a faster speed. And that will stop the pedestrian from crossing anyhow. So at the point in time, they will stop the vehicle and then the pedestrians will... will. So all these things, you know, when we get a man, we will be able to work at it and then the traffic situation will ease. But the 60% of the traffic, as I indicated, is the pothole at the bus stop there. If that area is fixed, I think the traffic you see from Sawam to Amasaman will be off the road. Well, we thank you for the work that you do, uh, even in view of the challenges that you're faced with. So thank you very much, DSP. Thank you too. And uh, whilst we're still here, I want Razak to focus on the traffic lights that are not working and this one that is broken. Mr. MC, I want to ask you yes. why the traffic lights are not working and we are forced to have policemen do the duty of something that traffic lights could do when they have other duty to do oh, in right. their office. The traffic light was disconnected because the contractor, um, they were here to do certain things. And originally, 
because the place is for the Ayalolo ambulance and um, um, STC. Now those the traffic light is not working. The reason why it's not working is simple. Um, that, I mean, the contractor is on the road, and um, but, they, but you, they, I mean, they are working on the road. I appreciate that. I, I, I appreciate that this has been awarded, and I respect that. But there are no contractors on the road, and the traffic light that has been disconnected, this one almost pulled down. It's not working. We can't have the police do the duty of traffic lights. I've, I've, I've asked about this particular. I've, I've asked the question you are asking, and I asked the contractor. Right now, we are having a man standing here. Instead of, instead of a robot, she do that for us. People, men are standing here um, directing traffic. If you see what is happening right now, I don't think it's proper. So I've asked the contractor if he can refix it for us for the meantime, so that the policeman will not be wasting time here from morning to evening, which uh, they might they can do another thing elsewhere. So, so, so give me, give me, give me timelines so that I, I can hold you accountable. I, I always don't like to give timelines of something that I'm, I'm not going to do it. If you said I should clear the women from the road, I will do it. I will give you a timeline that tomorrow I will clear them. In fact, you said three weeks and you did it in like yes, three days. Like three days, you know. So this one is across. And these traffic lights, I'll, I'll call the contractor today. I'll, I'll make sure I'll call the contractor today and ask him. But did you know something? The, the, the traffic light is, is at only one side, not the other side. So when it happened that way, if you are not careful, the people will cross from here and they'll be thinking there is another traffic light here. So the traffic light was meant for the Ayalolo bus and the STC on the left hand. So right now, if but you are I, but not I see, But I see another another traffic light there, uh, Arazak, let's capture it, where they are selling the songs. Yeah, I mean, and the one here, before it was, you know, we have a bus stop here. Okay. And they did it, well, if you stop here, it will give you a red light. That you have to move, you have to move, you have to move. It's not for the crossing, right? It's not for the crossing. So that is why I'm finding it difficult. If this traffic light is fixed again, right now, as we speak, if you are not careful, the MTTD have to go and stand here, and here there will be a traffic light here, and the people will be crossing. And if you are not careful, something else will happen. So we will we'll wait the two and see how best we can do it. But I realize there's another manhole. This one. This manhole, yes, yes. Um, we called the contractor. We wanted to come and we wanted to come and do the filling with a uh, um, um, uh, gravels, but they said no. Uh, tomorrow, maybe by the weekend, they are coming to fill it with um, a bitumen. That is why we have. Hold on, because I think last time you guys asked me about this particular manual. So if they are not coming this weekend, then I will use the gravels to do it. I like the fact that you also acknowledge it's a manhole. Yeah, it's a manhole. It's not a portal. It's a manhole. <laughs> <laughs> it's a manhole. The, I believe in that. If you go ahead a bit, there's also a market. Yeah. Is it the same situation as what you explained? A temporary yeah, it's, place it's because un, you don't have a place for them. Because we, we, we have asked all the cars that they have goods to pack there and offload their goods there. Like, if you are coming from the eastern region with your plantain, yam, cassava, and everything, don't stop here. But go and offload them there. That is why you see the women there. So the women will, will, will buy it from the, I mean, from the bulk, uh, I mean, sellers. Uh, so that one too is a separate thing that we have done to manage the traffic condition from the area. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so, so I, you see we are doing good management in Amazon. I'm keeping my eyes on you, sir. And that's my community traffic watch, if you like, highlighting the traffic challenges of Amasaman and also looking ahead to how they can be fixed. We've heard from the MTTD police commander. We've also heard from the MCE who is uh, detailing how they intend to solve the problems with the traffic, which largely is because of the nature of the roads. The roads are poor. So I will be focusing of this, on this and be giving you the updates in terms of the progress that's been made. One of the other issues that we've identified, even as uh, you know, we were having the conversations here, has been the traffic lights, which has been, which been broken down for I don't even know how long. Uh, but we are told it's because 
uh, of advice from the contractor. The road has been given out to a contractor to fix, but for some reason the contractor has not been on site. And so we're still having to deal with the potholes, which are almost manholes now. This has been Mamavi Oswabwaje reporting on the traffic challenges.